beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. These simple words begin the Judeo-Christian account of the formation of the universe. It is a story that has been told and retold for thousands of years, transcending religion and culture to become one of the most recognized narratives in the world. Through his word and will alone, God fashions the cosmos, sets into motion the mechanism of time and fills the empty world with creatures that can swim, fly and walk. From dust, God creates the first man, Adam. To Adam, he gives dominion over all things and places him within the earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden. Later, from Adam's rib, God shapes woman as a companion to man. It is that woman, Eve, who will eventually cause the fall of mankind, bringing into the world evil and death. For millions around the world, the Genesis account is a literal, detailed account of the creation of the world. Some see it as a metaphorical tale to explain the plight of humanity, and yet others see it as no more than a fanciful tale bearing no literal worth at all. Regardless of the lens through which it is read, the story of Adam and Eve is far more profound than many may realize. At face value, it's just one of a multitude of creation stories set down by our ancestors. But delve a bit deeper, and it becomes a profound story of the death of the mother goddess, and sets into motion attitudes that will prevail throughout the centuries to this very day. And at the heart of the story is not one, but two women created by the very hand of God, Lilith and Eve. The name of Eve may be a familiar one, but for many, Lilith is virtually unknown. Her name appears only once in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, and then only in certain early translations. Lilith was born of Mesopotamia, a terrifying she-demon of the wind and night. Lilith first emerges in the epic Sumerian poem, Gilgamesh and the Halupu tree. In the tale, the goddess Inanna has chosen a specific willow tree to create a throne from. When she goes to harvest the tree, however, she finds a terrifying trio of creatures has already taken possession of her prized tree. A dragon lies at its base, a zoo bird and her young reside in its branches, and the demoness Lilith resides within the tree itself. Gilgamesh comes to the aid of the goddess and banishes the creatures. Lilith, in this account, flees into the desert. In Assyria, Lilith was included among the Lilithu, a group of demons that preyed upon sleeping men, pregnant women, and newborn children. In Babylon, she was depicted as the prostitute of the goddess Ishtar. Likewise, she appears in earlier Sumerian tales as the prostitute or handmaiden of Inanna, who would be sent out to lead men astray. Regardless of the incarnation she took in the Mesopotamian world, Lilith was always portrayed as a nefarious seductress, leading men to evil and stealing the life from women and children. Throughout the ancient world, amulets and inscriptions have been uncovered that attempted to ward off the evil Lilith. Among these are so-called Lilith bowls. These bowls would be buried inside the house and were believed to be able to trap the demoness should she enter the abode. So well known was Lilith as a murderess of children and defiler of men that no explanation of her origins was given in her lone biblical appearance. She is simply stated as residing in infertile desolation, equating her to a force of chaos and turmoil. She does, however, re-emerge in the collection of ancient texts known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in Kulmaran in the mid-20th century. The ancient Kulmaran sect was well versed in demonology, and writes of Lilith in the Song for a Sage. This piece possibly used during exorcisms, lists Lilith among those that strike suddenly to lead astray the spirit of understanding and to make desolate the heart. Although already known among the Jewish people as a powerful demon, Lilith would not receive scholarly interpretation until the compilation of the Talmud. The Talmud, a principal text of Rabbinic Judaism, contains both legal discussions and interpretations of biblical content. In it, Lilith is described as having long hair and wings, 
possibly drawing on her earlier incarnations in Babylon. The picture created of Lilith within the Talmud is one of the horrific succubus, a she-demon that has sex with men while they sleep to spawn countless numbers of demonic children. The Talmud goes so far as to warn men to never sleep in a house alone, lest Lilith defile them in the night. For centuries, Lilith haunts the collective imagination of our ancestors as a malevolent force of destruction. She is feared and protected against, and her name is spoken in uneasy whispers. But beginning in the Middle Ages, Lilith will be reborn and introduced as the first wife created for Adam, a wild and indomitable woman. Lilith becomes a darker, more violent figure, the mother of all demons. The idea that God created an earlier version of woman before Eve comes from Jewish Midrashic culture. Midrash, an ancient and important practice within Judaism, is the tradition of making inferences based on biblical scripture to resolve conflicting passages. A careful reading of the book of Genesis reveals two opposing tales of the creation of woman. The first comes in Genesis 1 verse 27 and states, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. In this verse, it is implied that man and woman are created at the same time, from the same substance. Yet later, in the second chapter of Genesis, there is a more extensive account of creation that claims man was created first from the dust of the earth, and later woman created from the rib of Adam. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. The obvious discrepancies between the two creation stories gave rise within the Midrashic tradition that there must have been an earlier, failed version of woman created before the biblical Eve. It wasn't until the 8th to 10th centuries that Lilith emerged as the first wife of Adam. The earliest connection between Lilith and the unavailing first woman comes in the alphabet of Ben Sirah, largely considered today by scholars as a satirical text containing 22 chapters, each corresponding to one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It is in the fifth chapter of the alphabet that Lilith is introduced as the woman created in Genesis 1 verse 27. In this account, Adam and Lilith are created together, equally from the dust of the earth. But almost as soon as Adam and Lilith have been created, they began to argue. The tension escalates and finally erupts when Adam insists that Lilith take the submissive position during sex, insisting that he was created to be superior to women. Lilith refuses, saying, We are equal to each other, inasmuch as we are both created from the earth, when no resolution can be reached between the two, and neither willing to relent from their position. Lilith utters the ineffable name of God and flies away from the Garden of Eden, angry and probably a bit embarrassed, Adam prays to the creator to bring Lilith back to him. God then sends three angels, Sanoi, Sansanoi, and Samangeloth, to find Lilith and return her to Adam. The angels find her on the shore of the Red Sea, but she emphatically refuses to return to her suppressor. When threatened with death by the angels, Lilith proclaims that she was created to cause sickness and death in infants. She claims dominion over male babies for 8 days after birth, and for 20 days after the birth of a female child. To prevent the angels from slaying her, Lilith swore to them that any child bearing an amulet inscribed with the names of the three angels would be spared. The angels agreed, but cursed Lilith so that every day 100 of her demonic children would perish. When God learns that Lilith will not return to the garden, he causes a deep sleep to come over Adam. While he sleeps, God removes a rib from Adam and fashes the woman from Genesis 2 verse 22, Eve. She is presented to Adam, and he says in Genesis 2 verse 23, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. The rest of the story is undoubtedly familiar to most. The serpent convinces Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, which she in turn shares with her husband. Eating the fruit reveals to Adam and Eve their own nakedness, and they are ashamed and hide from God. When confronted, Adam blames the transgression on Eve, who in turn blames it on the serpent. In the end, all three are cursed and mankind falls from its once preeminent place in paradise. In some traditions, after the fall, Adam separates from Eve for a time, spying him alone. Lilith falls upon Adam as he sleeps, 
and he unknowingly sires a legion of demonic offspring with her. Lilith again becomes the succubus, birthing a race of children destined to die in multitudes every single day. And because she fled the garden before the fall, she remains untouched by death, forever preying on the sons of Adam. Lilith will become the consort of Samael, or Satan. Eventually, she will be all but forgotten, until reclaimed by modern feminists for her strength and unwavering independence. Comparing the Judeo-Christian creation story with other contemporary stories shows a distinct shift beginning to take place. No longer did life spring from the mother goddess. Instead, a father god reigns supreme without a feminine balance. In this way, the story of the Garden of Eden and the Fall of Man can be seen as a pivotal moment where the suppression of the divine feminine begins to occur. Before the Judeo-Christian reimagining of the creation of the cosmos, the great mother goddess was venerated throughout the ancient world. Her form often changed between cultures, but her essence remained the same. From her, all life sprang from a balanced connection to the god. When it was time for a creature to die, it was returned to the mother goddess, where it would find renewed life once again. This ever-flowing circle of birth, death and rebirth was evident in our ancient ancestors as they witnessed it every year with the passing of the seasons. In Genesis, the god Yahweh strips the duty of birth away from the mother goddess, becoming the sole source of creation. All things now come from God and God alone, from the earth the very body of the mother goddess, he creates man. Man is given dominion over earth and all living creatures. The great mother goddess is reduced to nothing more than a servant to mortal man, to be manipulated and used accordingly to his will. Putting aside for a moment the tale of Lilith and the first wife, Eve is then created from the rib of Adam in an act contrary to the natural order of life. She is not born of a mother, but created out of man, the tree of life. Once a symbol of the goddess herself, becomes the tree of knowledge and the catalyst for the fall of humanity. For the Yahweh's writers of the Bible, the mother goddess would bring about her own demise. When before death was seen as a natural transformation, once Eve eats of the forbidden fruit, death becomes a finality. No longer is it a transitory state linking birth to rebirth. Death becomes a barren void, a punishment that did not exist before Eve. In this way, the mother goddess is defeated. Woman has become the harbinger of death, whose life depends solely on the will of God. In cursing Adam and Eve, Yahweh also curses the earth itself. No longer will humanity dwell in the plush, fertile grounds of Eden. Instead, they will be forced to toil and suffer in the dry dust that was once the mother herself. For the early Judeo-Christians, one point was decidedly clear. Woman was the cause of all evil in the world. But how could she not be? In the minds of these early adherents, woman was flawed from the moment of her creation. Putting aside the story of Lilith, woman was secondary and created from inferior materials. She was weaker, subject to her husband's will as well as to the will of God. It is that weakness that allowed the serpent to tempt Eve into sin. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, it is stated, The son shall not bear the iniquities of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. And although the meaning of this verse is evident, the same separation of guilt was not afforded to the daughters of Eve. The iniquity of Eve became the justification for the repression of women throughout the Judeo-Christian world. Just as Eve had been created to serve Adam, women were seen as little more than property to their fathers and husbands. They possessed no degree of autonomy, as the women of other contemporary cultures enjoyed. Even the sacred act of birth would be ripped away from them, as men were believed to be the primary creator of life, and the female merely the incubator. The Bible Philosophers and scholars proclaimed women's vileness, weakness, and worthlessness. In recent decades, as feminism has grown from an idea into a worldwide movement, women have begun to reclaim the power stripped away from their foremothers. The independence and sexual freedom that Lilith was willing to give up paradise for, once viewed as evil and unnatural, is now championed by women seeking to separate themselves from outdated patriarchal attitudes. Eve becomes the symbol for the quiet strength of womankind that can be subdued but not destroyed. Lilith is the woman in the streets championing for equality at the top of her lungs, while Eve is the woman working quietly behind the scenes. Lilith is sexual freedom, and Eve the consummate mother. Together, 
they represent the whole of femininity. Modern pagans, both female and male, have also begun to reconnect with Lilith and Eve. For some pagans and occultists, Lilith represents the first mother, or sometimes the dark aspect of the goddess. Eve, as more people delve deeper into her mysteries, has begun to reclaim her position among the other great mother goddesses such as Isis, Astarte and Ishtar. As more people attempt to understand and connect with the energies of Lilith and Eve, other associations will undoubtedly emerge to transform our perception of both the individual and a womankind as a whole. Regardless of the multitude of varying interpretations of the Judeo-Christian creation story, the figures of Eve and Lilith persevere. Despite the best efforts of many, the mother goddess imagery within their stories has not been lost. Instead, it has been transformed, molded by countless cultures and the passing of time. It is likely that as the role of women continues to evolve, so too will the story of the first females of Genesis. Perhaps as our progenitors, that is their greatest contribution to humanity. The ability to persevere under duress and to rebel against anything that attempts to enslave the spirit. If you would like to learn more, please take a look at our book, Seven Ages of the Goddess. The words for this video were provided by Laurie Martin Gardner. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe and ring the bell for weekly content and we'll see you next time.